Greetings and welcome back. We are in Senior AP English and we are working now with Hamlet Act 4. Our objective this hour is to try to address Act 4. Uh, we'll, we'll be working, uh, I, I hate to say this, but we'll be working at the epidermal level for the most part, making some general observations about the fourth act. The fourth act serves in many ways as a bridge act. Shakespeare has created some real complexities in his play by having Hamlet kill Polonius. Obviously, Hamlet now must answer for the death, the murder of Polonius, and the way that that's going to happen is for Claudius to send Hamlet away to England, where England will then kill Hamlet. The only problem with this for Shakespeare is that he's not, I mean, this obviously doesn't help the continuation of the plot line in regards to Hamlet killing his uncle, and so now you've got to get Hamlet back to Denmark. All of that we will uh, learn about in the fourth act, and then ultimately then the play will close quickly in the fifth <laughs> act. In many ways, the play is over in the third act when Hamlet kills old man Polonius. As we've already pointed out, he has killed the father of a son who is now morally obligated for revenge. And in this process now, we know that the play must become ultimately a tragedy. Notice in 4.1 that one thing that the king says it is, it would have been so with us if we were there. Claudius is acutely aware that if he had been the one behind the arras or the curtain, he would have been the one killed. And to that degree, Claudius starts to think in more survival mode, and that's why he's going to send away the young kid, get him out of, get him out of uh, Denmark. Obviously, the king, Claudius, has a problem as well. How do you answer for the fact that under your watch, you allowed your second-in-command or your counselor to get stabbed to death by a crazy kid? Obviously, there's gonna, he's going to have to answer for this. And the quickest way to answer for it for Claudius is to just send the kid away, send Hamlet away. Scene two, I think I've already made a couple of comments about. Hamlet is going to continue to play verbal or linguistic uh, battle, as he's done all, all play long with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. He calls them a sponge or a nut that sits in the corner of the ape's mouth to be eaten uh, whenever to be used. He also will play games in regards to the king and Polonius and this whole notion of death. And then we will move on to scene three of four, act four, when uh, we, we'll uh, have, again, some of these observations regarding death and the whole notion of a beggar who goes out to fish and he will use a worm. And Hamlet muses that worm could have eaten on the body of a king. And now the beggar is using that worm that used to eat on the body of a king Hamlet is making an observation that will be in some ways the answer to the Aristotelian chain of value, where at the top we put our nobles and at the bottom we put our slaves and our nobodies. Shakespeare, in some ways, is taking that notion and he's turning it upside down. In other words, he says death is the great democratizer. Death makes everybody equal. It doesn't matter whether you are a king or whether you're a peasant nobody. When you die, maggots don't have any concern about whether you are a king or whether you are a beggar. Maggots are egalitarian, very democratic. And to that degree, so is death. Death, in other words, is the great leveler. It's the great equalizer. And to that degree, uh, Hamlet says, you know, we're all, kind of, we're all kind of in this together. Let's point out that some, some readers of this play and viewers of this play have said that once Hamlet kills old man Polonius, he starts to seem almost somewhat cavalier about dying. It's almost as if it doesn't seem to bother him anymore that he pretty much has figured out he's going to have to go, he's going to have to die. And he starts to speak in more cavalier ways about the whole thing of dying and what it means, and in the process, of course, making some really philosophic observations. Then he will say to his father, stepdad, farewell my loving mother and dear mother, and of course you have this whole thing of the father, Claudius still thinks Hamlet's nuts, man and uh, wife, uh, father and mother is man and wife, man and wife is one flesh, and all of this continues to play word games with Claudius as well. Scene four is best known if it's used at all, and often it's neglected because you have to edit out. If, they, if you edit out the Fortinbras subplot, you pretty much edit out this, sub, this uh, soliloquy of 4-4. Of, uh, four, four. And yet I think it's a really important soliloquy, and uh, for that reason, I think it's, it's, it's worth our time to at least look at it for a moment. Definitely, Shakespeare's continuing to play very philosophic games with us, and if you know your Plato, then this is going to be a very useful soliloquy for us. Take a look at what he says. He's watching these men who are going off to fight 
for a plot of land in Poland that nobody wants, not even the Poles, nobody cares about this plot of land, and yet thousands of men are going to go and fight for this piece of ground because two kings decided that's the way it needed to be. Now you could argue, and many have, that Shakespeare's here pointing out the stupidity of the conflict resolution through war, no doubt. And yet, more importantly, Hamlet is able to internalize the fact that warriors and soldiers are going off to fight because a nation's honor is at stake, and he himself has yet to get his vengeance. Hamlet, of course, is ready to board a boat here and to leave in a few moments to head towards England. And his honor is at stake, as Hamlet kind of comes to realize. Notice he will say how all occasions do inform against me. Yeah, you're right. You're about to leave and go off to England and spur my dull revenge. And then he asks an interesting question. What is a man? If his chief good and market of his time be but to sleep and feed. In other words, Hamlet will ask the question, what is the difference between a human being and any other animal in the animal kingdom? Uh, his answer is, at first, a, hum a human pretty much is a beast. No more. Kind of like a cow in a field, if you will. Sure, he that made us with such large discourse looking after and before, before and after, gave us not that capability and godlike reason to fuss in us and use. And then he like pauses and he's like, wait a minute. The capacity to think and reason seems to make humans more than just cows in a field. Now, whether it be bestial oblivion and, or some craven scruple of thinking too precisely on the event, thinking too precisely on the event should immediately take you back in your observations to level 3A, right? And more particularly, the to be or not to be soliloquy. Uh, we think too much, and that's sometimes what paralyzes us. A thought which quartered hath but one part wisdom, never three parts coward. I do not know why yet I live to say this thing's to do. He's continuing to berate himself on the fact that he has not yet done what it is he's supposed to do. Sith I have cause and will and strength and means to do it. Examples gross as earth exhort me. Witness this army of such mass and charge led by a delicate and tender prince. He's talking about Fortinbras. You might put a note to yourself here that this is already the setup for what will happen at the end of the play. Two things. Obviously, Hamlet will be dead. And then there's going to be this power vacuum, because obviously Claudius is going to be dead too. Who's going to take over the kingdom? Who's going to run it? Hamlet will actually turn over Denmark too, young Fortinbras. So uh, you might make a note of that. <coughs> he says, rightly to be great is not to stir without a great argument, but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honors its stake. In other words, he says, I have every reason to feel that I've been dishonored. And I have every reason now to fight. How stand I then that a father killed a mother stained excitements of my reason and my blood and let all sleep while to my shame the imminent death of 20,000 men that for a fantasy, a trick of fame, go to their graves like beds. And then finally he finishes, <coughs> from this time forth, my thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth. Go ahead and jot down in your notes real quickly this observation. It seems that Hamlet has shifted in some way in his thinking about who he is and what he must do. Jot down, in what way has Hamlet changed in your estimation? My thoughts be bloody or be nothing worth. <coughs> and how is this observation somewhat diametrically opposed to what he has said earlier in the play? Like, let not my heart lose its nature. Let me not become like Nero. You know, this kind of thing. How is Hamlet shifting or changing, do you think? Has murder changed Hamlet in some way, do you think? And if so, in what way? What do you think, Batson? Has he changed man? Yeah. How? He's more, uh, belligerent. He's more what? Belligerent. Belligerent? What well, his thoughts? I mean, he's not directly belligerent. Right. Keep going. Is he hardened? Has he lost his nice guy nature? Wow, that's an interesting Homer uh, reference, and we can use it. Outstanding, Miss Kennedy. He starts the play out seeming to be more like Paris. By this point, he's become more like Achilles. Yeah, there's people that got to get jacked. Polonius wasn't the last one. But wait a minute, even before he stabbed Polonius, we already have a sense of this, how? Jot it down in your notes. What's the first real indication that's, that something's up with Hamlet? He's, gonna, he's probably going to go ahead and start being coming nasty. Who is he most nasty to? Ophelia. Get thee to a nunnery. Yeah, I've heard well enough what, what uh, madmen you make of us, right? 
So yeah, you already got this sense. Hamlet, Hamlet's not a very nice guy all of a sudden, and it's making it more and more difficult for the audience to kind of pull for him. Because even though he seems to have right on his side, he himself is starting to lose that thing that makes him a human. Notice the irony here. He asked that. What's the difference between me and a wolf? Well, wolf maybe doesn't have the reason that, that humans have, right? Scene five. Shakespeare loves to use this vague antecedent. The queen will say, will not speak with her. Of course, the only two women in the play of merit is, of course, the queen and, and, and Ophelia. Ophelia's lost her mind. She comes onto the stage singing these little ditties. We've already pointed out that some of these words will have powerful, double, and even triple meanings. But I want to point out the one soliloquy given to the queen. It's fascinating, and it mirrors at 3A, if you want to, if you want to note this. It's kind of cool to note this. It mirrors what Lady Macbeth will say at the end of the play, Macbeth, when she, it finally has occurred to her that she got what she wanted, but she lost what she had. Take a look in 4-5, what the queen says at roughly line 15, 16, 17. She's left alone for a very brief period of time before Ophelia comes on stage, and she says, To my sick soul, notice her soul is sick, the queen, as sin's true nature is, Shakespeare loves to give these little instructional propedeutics. Each toy seems prologue to some great amiss. So full of artless jealousy as guilt, it spills itself in fearing to be spilled. What did, what did she just say? This is a remarkable set of lines. I wish we had more time. We could go into it. What did she just say? And what is it that you want to... What is it about guilt and its fear of being betrayed? <clears throat> Leads yeah. up to something bad like that. Yeah. When you do something bad and then you try and hide it, that hiding is almost always going to give way to the guilt. And sooner or later, it's going to become fairly self-evident that you are guilty. Remember how Shakespeare said this in, in um, Act 1? Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. That seed and garden theme. You take seeds, you don't know what they're going to be. You put them in the ground. Sooner or later, they're going to grow. And you're going to see what it is that you, that you planted. Notice Ophelia will say, I hope all will be well. It's fairly clear that there's two things that have upset her. One, obviously, is the death of her dad. The second is the fact that Hamlet has been sent away. And, of course, Hamlet and Ophelia are clearly a thing. I mean, if you read any of these lines <clears throat> by, um, by Gis and by St. Charity, alack and fie for shame, young men will do it if they come to it. I mean, it's not difficult to understand what we're talking about here. By cock, they are to blame. Quoth she, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. So what I have done by yonder son, and thou hast not come to my bed. Of course, tumbled has two meanings, not only sexual congress, but also, of course, pregnancy or conception. And so it's fairly easy to make the assumption that Ophelia is with child, and she is distraught about the fact, notice how she is abandoned by everyone. No one yet in our class has asked the simple question, where is Ophelia's mother? Right? We begin the play, and Ophelia doesn't have a mom. And then the two men in her life, Laertes and her father, are both always kind of preaching at her and controlling her. Remember, she says to her father, I will obey you, my lord. Um, she has to. She doesn't have a choice. And then Laertes, her bro, goes away to college, leaving her only with her father and her crazy boyfriend. Her father puts her out there in harm's way to be attacked verbally by Hamlet, and that's exactly what he does. Get thee to a nunnery. Go. And that's the last time that Hamlet and Ophelia will speak to each other, um, you know, and, and, and they're nasty to each other, obviously. And then her dad is killed leaving her completely alone, and in the process she loses her mind, she goes nuts. The king will say it, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions, and then all of a sudden, uh, <clears throat> you, know, the, uh, um, you know, the reality is that she is, she's lost her mind, she's gone, she's gone crazy. Laertes shows up. Laertes is really like Polonius when he's all fired up. 
Ironically, at line 120 and following, the king will say something very interesting. Laertes will show up with a blade in his hand. The queen will step forward to try to protect her man. Claudius will say something quite fascinating, and Shakespeare loves these kind of ironic lines on stage. Notice the queen, or the king. He will say, what is the cause, Laertes, that thy rebellion looks so giant-like? Let him go, Gertrude. Don't worry, Laertes. He's got a sword in his hand. No worries. Laertes can't do anything to me. Look what he says. Do not fear our person. There's such divinity that doth hedge a king that treason can but peep to what it would. Acts little of his will. What has he just said? Kill me, it's going to be bad for you. No, you're close. You're close. Read it again. What has he said? The king says to his wife, don't worry. He's got a blade, but don't worry. There's such divinity that doth hedge a king. What does this mean? Uh, they believe the king would be so righteous that they killed him. Basically the, he says, you, you can't hurt me. Laertes can't hurt me because I have a hedge that protects me by God because I'm a king. Kings are protected by the divinity. God. God protects me. There isn't anything bad that can happen to me. What's darkly ironic about Claudius being the one saying this? You're right. He's the one that jacked his own brother who was the king, right? D dark irony here that Claudius would actually believe, oh, no, no, God will take care of me because I'm a king. And divinity, of course, takes care of kings. Of course, if you're a king or queen, let's call it queen this time, watching this play, let's call her Elizabeth, shall we? Watching this play, this is an interesting line. That queens and kings like to believe that they're kind of protected by divinity, but what is it that this play has shown? Wait a minute. What is it that a lot of these tragedies show about holding power and keeping power? Over and over. Right. Duncan will even say it. There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face, the Thane of Caldor. He was a man on whom I had complete trust. Then he turns around and gives all of his complete trust to Macbeth. Macbeth will invite him to his house, where, of course, Duncan will not wake up the next morning. These plays seem to suggest over and over again that regicide happens a lot more commonly and easily than one would imagine. You can imagine that political figures watching these plays, especially the tragedies, have a sense to be a little bit uncomfortable when they're watching them. And yet, we know that not only Queen Elizabeth to James I adored these plays and loved that Shakespeare would write these plays, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting kind of debate that one can have about what really is the point that Shakespeare's making. The king will work Laertes, <clears throat> and then onto the stage, he'll kind of calm him down, and then onto the stage will come Ophelia, and big brother cannot believe that his sister has lost her mind. Are you ready for this? She comes on the stage with flowers, and she gives these flowers one at a time to different people on stage. Elizabethans understood flowers symbolized something. Let me share with you some of the symbolism that is going on here that Shakespeare, and Shakespeare can make, can make comments without actually making them. Watch this. Since Ophelia is distributing flowers, I'm reading from a scholar now. Since Ophelia, a, a, a Shakespearean scholar. Since Ophelia is distributing flowers, the season must be spring or summer, each flower had for the Elizabethan its own meaning. Watch this real quickly, and you might even want to jot this down. It's quite fascinating. So she's not just distributing flowers. She's giving specific kinds of flowers to specific kinds of people. Watch how this works. <clears throat> Rosemary, remembrance, that's what it stands for. And pansies, which stands for thoughts, she gives to her brother. It makes sense. Phenol, which represents flattery. And columbine which represents disloyalty or ingratitude, she gives to Claudius. Fascinating, right? Which, what's the phenol? Fleen, phenol represents flattery. And columbine, which represents disloyalty or ingratitude, she gives to Claudius, the king. Rue, which stands for sorrow, and daisies, which stands for infidelity. Okay, the daisy was the flower of the cockle. It was the flower of to be unfaithful. Daisies for infidelity she gives to Gertrude. Hmm. Seeming to kind of second what Hamlet has already said about his mother. Frailty or fickleness, thy name is woman. Ophelia gives her violence, which stands for faithfulness to no one. She holds on to the violets. 
And in that process, kind of seeming to suggest that all faith is now gone, right? All faith is now gone. <clears throat> Notice that at the end of this, Laertes will, at the end of scene five, Laertes will tell us what it is he's most upset about. He says he's so upset because of the means of death. How did my dad die? That upsets him. But also, notice he says no trophy. This is the very end of, the, of, of scene five. No trophy, no sword, nor hatchment, or his bones, no noble right, nor formal. There's the word. Laertes is most upset that his daddy didn't get any kind of ostentatious funeral. In other words, Laertes is like, how dare you bury my father without ostentation? Laertes is a lot like his, a lot like his son. How do we say it? The apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. Laertes is a lot like his father. He's far more interested in show than he is in substance. Scene six is brief. It tells us how Shakespeare is going to solve his problem of getting Hamlet back. Simply, they are attacked on their ship by pirates. Those pirates ultimately will be the way that Hamlet will escape. Ironically, he ends up on the ship with the pirates. Rosencrantz and, and Guildenstern end up on the ship headed towards England, and the pirates then will be bringing Hamlet back. And in this process, Shakespeare is able to fix his problem of how this he's going to get revenge. Scene seven. The king will work Laertes. We will see how good he is at fooling the young boy into believing that it is totally Hamlet's fault that, La that Polonius, Laertes' father, was killed. The reason that the king says he doesn't, he doesn't uh, punish outright Hamlet is he says for two reasons. Uh, for the exam, you may want to point these out. There's two reasons why the king says he didn't, he didn't kill Hamlet right away. The first is because Hamlet's loved of the distracted multitudes. We've, said, we've heard this one already once before. That is to say the people of Denmark really like Hamlet. The second is because of his mother. He says, you know, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't kill the boy because of his mom, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's why he, Claudia says, I was sending him away. It's, it's going to be in the middle of all of this that the king will get a message that says Hamlet's returning. And in the process, the king then throws together this plan. This plan, as we've already mentioned, will involve, first of all, flattering Laertes into believing he's a really good sword fighter when he's actually not, using this Frenchman named Lamont that is a really good sword fighter. Claudius kind of lies to Laertes and says, oh yeah, Lamont says you are better than him, etc. But then in the middle of all of this, and this is at the heart of this scene, and I think one of the more compelling moments in the play, take a look at it. The king... And Laertes are talking, and at roughly line 105, the king says, now out of this, in other words, he's putting together his plan. Claudius is a genius criminal. Let's point this out for just a general observation. Shakespeare is brilliant at constructing criminals. Think about the brilliant criminals that he creates, the bad guys, right? I mean, Edmund is a pretty bad guy in King Lear. Out vile jelly, he will allow for his own father's eyes to be torn out of their sockets, thrown onto the floor, and stomped on on the stage. It doesn't get any more vile than that in any of Shakespeare's plays. And yet, Edmund, you've got to admit, he's pretty smart. I mean, he knows. Let's point it out. He is a really good liar. He's a good manipulator. He's a good spin doctor. We could continue. Macbeth's not bad either. And we could keep going. Obviously, here, we're looking at a really fine criminal. He's making it up on the fly. He's able to kind of say, now what are we going to do? And then all of a sudden he pauses and he looks at Laertes and he asks him an interesting question. He says, Laertes, was your father dear to you? Put it in your own words. What's he asked the boy? Do you care Did you love your dad? Did you love your dad? Or... Are you like the painting of a sorrow, a face without a heart? Whoa, 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 there we are. We're back to that seeming thing again, right? I have that within which passeth show. Remember, Hamlet says to his mother, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. There it is. I mean, the king will ask Laertes, did you really love your dad or are you like a painting? Of course, we immediately come back to the lines of the king himself when he said, right after those Polonius lines, right before the to be or not to be soliloquy, that the king says, I am, my actions are kind of like the prostitute's painted face. We come back to painting. Did you really love your dad, or are you just a really good faker? To which Laertes immediately responds, of course I love my... No, 
Look how Laertes responds. Fascinating. What? See, we're back to this again. What? I don't know. What? Why did you ask me this? The king says, not that I think you did not love your father. Wow. For the romantics in the house, we're going to unsettle you a little bit. Look at what Claudius says about love. Not that I think you did not love your father, but that I know love is begun by time. And that I see in passages of proof, time qualifies the spark and fire of it. Put it in your own words. What's he saying about love is a fire? But it's a fire that does what? Inevitably does what? Starts to burn out, doesn't it? It can only burn. Fire can only burn for so long. There's no such thing as an eternal flame for Shakespeare's audience. Fire inevitably must burn out. Keep going. There lives within the very flame of love a kind of wick or snuff that will abate it. Abate means stop. And nothing is at a like goodness still, for goodness, growing to a pleurisy, dies in its own too much. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What did you just read? And what did he just say about love? No matter how powerful or passionate your love is, what does he say about it? Inevitably, it must go away. It cannot last forever. Love cannot last forever because it's like a flame. And inevitably, buried within the very essence of love is its own end. Then he makes these interesting observations which sound a whole lot like the to be or not to be soliloquy conscience makes cowards of us all. That we would do, we should do when we would. You say you're gonna do something, <laughs> you should do it right away. Why? For this would changes and hath abatements and delays as many as there are tongues, our hands, our accidents. And then this should is like a spendthrift sigh that hurts by easy. Now that is a fascinating little aside. What is it that he's just said to Laertes? That we would do, we should do when we would means what? Don't, don't, talk yourself out. don't procrastinate. The human challenge is to overcome procrastination, to do what you say you're going to do. But wait a minute. Right about the moment that we kind of go, yeah, yeah, I guess I kind of believe that. Wait a minute. But to the quick of the ulcer, Hamlet comes back. <clears throat> what would you undertake to show yourself your father's son indeed more than in... And there we are again. See, and it's at this point that I have seniors that just started, really? Words? That's the word he uses? As in words, words, words? As in, did you really love your father? Are you a doer? Or are you just a talker, thinker? That we would do, we should do when we would means what for Claudius? What is he telling Laertes? Whatever you do, don't think about killing Hamlet. Because if you start thinking about killing Hamlet, you may never get around to doing it. You've got to be unconscious in your actions. He asks him, what would you do? Notice that Laertes says, dude, I would cut his throat in the church. Churches are supposed to be places of sanctuary. You're not, you, you're not supposed to murder people inside of a church. To kill somebody inside of a church sends your own soul to hell. What's Laertes just said? I'm willing to do what? I'm willing to go to hell to make sure that he dies. And yet look what Laertes says next. Amazing irony. Look what he says. And immediately we're going to be reminded of when this very same actor was kneeling on the front of the stage and there was a sword right over his head. And Hamlet had a chance to kill him, and then he said, oh, no more horrid hint, he says, about his sword. I'm going to kill him so that he goes to hell. Look what the king says. Oh, no place should indeed should murder sanctuaries. Revenge should have no bounds. He says, no, 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 we don't want to kill him in a church. Why don't we want to kill Hamlet in a church? Because go to heaven. Right, right. His soul will go to heaven. We don't want to do that. we got to send his soul to hell. Let's not do this, so let's not do this killing in the church thing. Let's kill him somewhere else. And now all of a sudden, Hamlet and Claudius start to sound very similar in their, in their speaking about revenge. And then again, of course, to the plot of how they're going to kill this kid. As we've said, there's kind of a tripartite approach. One, they're going to fight without a baited sword for Claudius or for Laertes. Two, they're going to put poison on the sword. Three, they're going to put some poison in a cup. 
So, so one way or another, the young kid's going to get jacked. And then, of course, we're told that Ophelia has drowned herself. Your sister's drowned, Laertes, the queen will say. Laertes is stunned. Drowned? Oh, where? Now, this is a fair question to ask. Dude, your sister is nuts. You saw her the last time and she laughed. What's the obvious question in regards to Big Brother? Right. I thought your job's to take care of your sister. What's Laertes been doing? Yeah, he's been talking about murdering somebody. Murdering Hamlet. Instead of taking care of his sister. And what has his sister done? Well, she's wandered off, we're told, the queen. There's a willow grows a slant of brook that shows her hoar leaves in the grassy stream. There with fantastic garlands did she make of crow flowers, nettles, daisies. Notice the word daisies used again. And, and long purples. That liberal shepherds give a grosser name. But our coal maids do dead men fingers call them. Notice Ophelia dies picking flowers. What is it that Hamlet called the world in the very first act? The world was what? An unweeded garden. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. The garden theme is going to be recapitulated all the way through this. Her clothes spread wide and mermaid-like a while they bore her up. And, and an intellectual audience immediately goes back to when Hamlet will call Ophelia in the last time they spoke. A nymph, a mermaid. With time she chanted snatches of old tunes as one incapable of her own distress. Or like a creature native and endued unto that element, but long it could not be till that her garments heavy with their drink pull the poor wretch from her melodious lay to muddy death, Ophelia dies singing songs. And down she goes. This is really the tragic moment of the play. Ophelia has done nothing to deserve this. And the obvious question is who's to blame? Who do you blame for this kind of tragedy? Some will say most at fault some will say maybe dad was a little bit too harsh maybe brother should have been there but a lot of people will put the onus right on Hamlet's shoulders dude you did everything that you had to do to ruin this girl and you are the one responsible if you take that approach Hamlet is now responsible for how many deaths right Right? We're now at two, aren't we? And we've got more coming. Why? Because we know that he's already said he's going to jack Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They will die because of Hamlet. That doubles it already to four. And we know that Claudius will soon die. And we're also, of course, going to already guess that Laertes is probably going to go. And, of course, his mama's going to go. So by the end of the play, all of these dead bodies that are lying on stage, or off stage but dead... We're aware, to some degree, are all because of one guy. Laertes will say, too much of water hast thou, poor Ophelia. I'm not going to cry anymore for you. He says, instead, I'm going to go and take care of some business. The king, of course, worried that Laertes now will get all upset and worked up again. All right, there you go. The uh, end of the fourth act. The fifth act will begin. Just turn the page and look. Take a look at where we are. Shakespeare's genius sense of timing. We finish with the death of Ophelia and 5-1 open square. We are at a graveyard. With Does it say grave diggers in your, in your collection or does it call them clowns? It says clowns in most, in most, in most folios. And here's why. They are grave diggers, but they're actually clowns. They're jokers. Shakespeare will finish a powerfully dramatic scene at the end of Act 4, and he'll begin by joking in Act 5. Come back tomorrow, and we'll set up your uh, study after, of course, a little bit of a, uh, of a review of